You're listening to Nutrition Matters Podcast with Paige Smathers, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist. Hi everyone, it's Paige Smathers. Thanks so much for being here. Nutrition Matters Podcast explores what really matters in nutrition and health with a sensitive and realistic approach. To help support the podcast, please consider making a donation at positive-nutrition.com slash podcast. If you find this episode interesting, engaging, or helpful in your life, please consider donating, sharing with friends and family, and leaving a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, whatever podcast app you use to listen to this podcast. You can leave a review about this podcast straight from your podcast app, search Nutrition Matters Podcast, click reviews, and then write a review. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook if you'd like to have a little more food for thought. Thank you for listening. Hi there. Welcome to Nutrition Matters Podcast, and thanks so much, as always, for joining me. I'm so excited to bring you this episode with Laura Thomas, who is such an incredible force for good when it comes to the world of nutrition, intuitive eating, health at every size. She's fantastic. If you like research, if you like kind of getting into the nitty gritty, she's your girl. And so I am so excited to bring you this episode with her, where we talk about Uh, This one was kind of a hard one to title, to be honest, because we talk about how really sometimes this is about the food, but it's not about the food at all. And sometimes, um, you know, we need to have conversations about things that might seem peripheral to food in order to really get to the root of what's going on for a struggle, for a person who's struggling with food. So in this episode, Laura and I talk about eating disorder prevention. We talk a little bit about... um, research, actually. We talk about that 95% statistic that people throw around a lot about how diets fail 95% of the time. She dives into that. We also spend a lot of time talking about this term weight stigma. And in the podcast, we we talk about it a little bit and define it a little bit. But if you're interested in that, I also have an episode 113 that's all about exploring weight stigma with Ashley Bennett. So that was a really good one as well. I'm also linking to some of the, the things that we talked about in the podcast, if you'd like to kind of study up a little bit more. And then we also talk about kind of the nuance of, of weight science and dive into some of the things that um, maybe we don't always, always talk about when we're just more scratching the surface. So this is a really fantastic episode. I'm super excited to bring it to you. This has been a long time coming. And um, for anyone who's local to Salt Lake, I just want to make a quick announcement. I am running the first ever body image resilience group here in Salt Lake City. Uh, I was going to just run one group, but the interest has been so great that I'm probably going to be running two, a morning group and an evening group. This is eight weeks long, utilizing the online program created by Beauty Redefined. And so what it is, is you access the online program, you complete one unit, and then we meet each week for eight weeks to discuss what you learned in the online portion. So you pay for the group and you get access to uh, the group processing, but also to the online program as well with the fee that you pay. So if you're interested in that and you're listening to this podcast right as it gets released, um, go ahead and hop on the website, positive-nutrition.com slash group and fill out the interest form at the bottom. I will be making final selections toward the beginning of September And uh, the group starts September 11th and runs through October 30th. And I'm really excited to do this. It's just, it's, uh, it's, the interest has already been so great. And I'm excited to put this on and excited to see how it all goes. So if you're local to Salt Lake and you're interested in having a group for um, processing body image things, uh, check it out. See if it might be a good fit for you. As always, if you are uh, interested in joining the uh, podcast group we have, it's called Nutrition Matters Podcast Community on Facebook, and just ask to join and I will approve you. Um, We do little live videos. We support each other. It's a great little community there. Also, uh, stay tuned because next week I will be announcing another really exciting thing um, on the podcast, so be sure to tune into next week's episode. Um, episode 130. 
And um, if you'd like to be the, the first to hear about the um, the new announcement I'm making next week, you can join my email list. That's just positive nutrition.com and then scroll all the way down to the bottom and just leave your email there. And I promise I don't spam anybody. I hardly ever send emails out. It's just uh, just really for promoting new things that come out or um, events that you might be interested in. And uh, let's see with that. I just hope you enjoy this episode so much. I love Laura. I love her style. I also want to just say uh, there's a little moment in the podcast that I think is kind of funny and something that you should know and appreciate about Laura is she is like the queen of swearing. She's like F-bomb all over the place and I love it. I love the sassiness. I love the like passion and fire. On my podcast, I try to kind of keep steer away from, from swearing just so that you know, if you have little kids around or something, you can still listen to the to the episodes freely. Of course, we do talk about tricky subjects, but at least you don't have to be concerned about swear words. But um, Laura did such an incredible job not swearing one time this entire podcast episode. So just keep your ears out for that. I, we both thought that that was kind of funny. Um, but anyway, enjoy this episode. I'm so glad you're here. You all are just so awesome. And I hope that you get a lot out of this week's episode. Enjoy. Welcome, Laura, to Nutrition Matters Podcast, and thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, Paige. I'm really excited to be here. I listen to your podcast all the time, so it's kind of surreal that I'm on it. Well, right back at you. It was so fun. <laughs> the, a couple months ago, I came on your podcast, and so we finally got some time to get you um, on mine, and I just am so thrilled to have the chance to sit down with you and learn more about you and um, and your new book that's coming out. Let's talk really quickly about that. When is the book out? It is out in the UK on the 10th of January, 2019. So like- Oh, you still have some the time. National Diet Culture Month. Yes. <laughs> um, I don't have dates for the US uh, and Canada and Australia and or any other countries at this point. But yeah, I'll be kind of announcing that on social media as and when I, I have more information. Um, but right now, the UK, um, it's going to be the 10th of January. That's so great. So usually you can you can order books early too, just, just to kind of get your copy or get on like the list or something too. So people yeah, can keep their eye out for the, that. What is that yeah, called? Pre, you can pre-order. Pre-order. There you go. Yeah, and I'll be sharing. I'll be sharing links because right now you can again only pre-order in the UK. But okay. um, yeah, like actually pre-orders are a really big deal. I just yeah. like, I've learned. I'm learning all this book stuff that I didn't know before. But um, yeah, they're they're kind of uh, an indication of how the book's going right. to sell. Right. And so, yeah, the publisher takes that pretty seriously. So I'll be pushing those pre-order links. Yeah. Soon. <laughs> yeah. So everybody listening, pre-order when you can to help Laura out, especially if you're going to buy it anyway, buy it or get it in the pre-order. All right. Well, let's um, let's just get into talking a little bit about you, kind of what you do now. And then we'll start in with uh, kind of hearing your story and talking about some of the topics at hand for the day. So um, who are you and what do you do, Laura? So I am a registered nutritionist, which is not a title that probably your U.S. audience are familiar with, because in, in the U.S. you have registered dietitian. And sort of side note, I actually did nutrition and dietetics training in the U.S., so kind of, yeah, it just to complicate things a little bit <laughs> there. But in the U.K., I'm a registered nutritionist, which means that I work more on sort of the prevention side of things and um, less on the like the clinical treatment of things. And so my primary focus is on eating disorder prevention, really. So I work with with women in particular, but really all people who are on that sort of disordered eating trajectory. And my role is to really help prevent that from slipping into a a clinically relevant or a full blown eating disorder. And so I'm working with women who are like chronic dieters. And sorry, again, another side note is the eating disorder services that we have in the UK are really underfunded and they're really, um, yeah, they're, we just don't have enough resources in our eating disorder services. And so that's why it's critical that we catch people who are in the, those sort of, um, 
earlier stages maybe of, of an eating disorder before they really get um, to the point where someone might need to be hospitalized. Okay, so the so, focus is on prevention then. Yeah. For you at yeah, least, so, but is it is it in the UK a big focus or is it just kind of underfunded because it's not a priority or people don't realize it's a problem or what? Uh, no, I think I think everyone is is aware and we know that our eating disorder services are getting pretty stretched at the moment just because and we're not sure if it's an increase in awareness or an actual increase in um in the prevalence of eating disorders, but we know that uh, our our national health services is, is pretty stretched, and there's just we have um, a conservative government in the UK at the moment, and they've made a lot of budget cuts gotcha. all, across a lot of different services. So it's not just eating disorders and mental health services that are suffering; it's kind of everyone's feeling the austerity. Um, so. I can't remember where I was with that. No, that's okay. You're explaining what you do. And are you, I know you have, a, it's called the London Center for Intuitive Eating. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And so I'm also a certified intuitive eating counselor. And so when I talk about eating disorder prevention, I'm looking at it, the, or the, the framework or the model that I'm using for that is, uh, an intuitive eating lens, uh, a health at every size, non-diet, weight inclusive, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's the approach that I'm taking to helping prevent disordered eating from slipping into a full-blown eating disorder. And I also work with with people who have been chronic dieters and who are, you know, going round and round the dieting merry-go-round to help them break that cycle. Yeah. And then you got a PhD here in the in the US, I think in Texas, is that right? Yeah, I was at Texas A&M University doing nutrition and dietetics. And then I moved to Cornell University where I was doing some some research around um uh, it was an obesity prevention. Uh, I say that word like it's a dirty word, <laughs> but it was an it was an obesity prevention intervention, and it was aimed at improving the nutritional value of of school meals and getting kids to make quote healthier choices. And um, I, you know that's not the my really my area of interest anymore. But I learned so much from that experience in terms of how research is done, how research is conducted, yes, um, how that... to be critical yeah. of, of, the, of the things that we um, read and, you know, even even just like nutrition headlines. And um, I think that's really important to then be able to decipher nutrition messages and nutrition information to to help translate those messages for the lay public. So you need to have a really good understanding of the science, first of all, to then be able to be like, okay, yeah, this study is showing X, Y, and Z, but what they didn't show is this, and what they can't actually make that conclusion based on the methods that they were using, right. or the questions that they were asking, or the hypothesis, and da 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 da. That's one thing when I think about you, I, that's kind of one thing that I think about is that you're really good at that. You're really good at being like, okay, peeps, this study just came out. I'm going to break it down in like the most epic Instagram post of your life. So catch me in the comments too. <laughs> you know, I love it. I mean, it's so, it's so great. And you're like, I personally really love just you're sassy. You're like, you know, you're like, you're not taking anything from anyone. I just love it. I think you like, you do such a good job of like making like stiff, boring or what could be boring research. Just be, you know, really exciting honestly you just do such a good oh. job of communicating those messages that are, that can be so tricky to um to do so I think you're really really good at that oh that's so sweet of you to say so because I I kind of feel like I've lost my Instagram mojo at the moment <laughs> so... well you have been writing a book so I think you get a pass <gasps> on that <laughs> yeah I know I know and I can't wait to be able to like take bits from the book and share it on Instagram, but we're, we're a little ways away from that yet. Yeah. Well, that'll be easy. Then you'll just copy and paste, right? Yeah, that's what I'm really <laughs> looking forward to. Uh, okay. So I'm really interested to know um, the context of like you growing up and your story and what brought you, you know, what brought you to where you are today? What brought you to write the book that you've written? Um, 
Yeah, start there, and then maybe I'll ask some follow-up questions to kind of uh, focus the conversation. Yeah, sure. So I think um, my story is probably pretty typical of, of a lot of people who get into this work in the sense that I had a, a fairly disordered relationship with food as I was growing up. Um, we had a lot of, like I had a, I, I'm trying to be careful here because I recognize that there's a lot of privilege in m my growing up, but at the same time, it wasn't um, particularly straightforward <laughs> either. And, and, and there was some trauma there, childhood trauma and um, just kind of, it was quite a difficult environment to grow up in. And I ended up using a lot of times using food as, as a comfort. Um, it was kind of like that security blanket that even though everything else around me was really intense and changing and I had no control over it and I didn't really necessarily always know what was going on, but food was kind of that constant. And I, I ended up becoming a chubbier kid and, and a fat teenager. And um, that I think then led to, or led to that experience of probably what I would now, although I didn't understand this at the time, but was, was weight stigma, right? So negative comments about my weight, um, bullying, teasing. I share this on my podcast a lot, but I had the nickname Thunder Thighs when I was like 14, 15. I don't know if you can call it a nickname because it was kind of a mean thing. Well, according so, to according to Jess Baker, you know, the uh, her tagline for her book, Land Whale, yeah. is like on turning insults into nicknames. So I think it's I think it's a good method to just reframe that as, oh, yeah, that was my nickname. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And that's a great book. I love that book. Um, so, yeah, I had that experience. And um, I then I really I remember being in a class at school and we were being shown this video about all this stress on the national health service. And one like very vivid memory I have is of this very heavy man being like airlifted out of his house because he was too big to get out of his house on his own accord. So he could, he couldn't walk through the door basically. And this sort of, I mean, again, now I understand how problematic that was. And that was, you know, purely a fear mongering tactic on the part of this program. Right. But that just like really freaked me out. And, and that was the moment that I was like, yeah, I'm going to study nutrition. I'm going to fix all the fat people. And, and I was fat at this point. And was and there a I, desire to like, quote, fix yourself? I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And, and I remember going and I, I'm not going to say specific behaviors because I don't want to trigger anyone, but I significantly reduced the amount of food that I was eating and started doing a lot more exercise, not in a healthy way at all, but specifically to lose weight. And it's that whole, that classic story of like the first diet works so well. And, um, so I, and I, and, and, you know, I was thinner for a long period of time and I went off to university and I studied nutrition. And, and I think like, I think when I was in when I was in university, certainly my, um, I was, I was eating like a student diet, really like it, my eating behavior was relatively normal. That's not true. Actually. I went through like a little orthorexic phase where I would only eat like salads, <laughs> um, cause I was reading some weird nutrition books, but that, that was kind of like a little blip. And then, <laughs> but overall, like, you know, I was doing the student thing where I would eat pizza at like three o'clock in the morning and, um, you know, I would say that my eating was relatively normal, but then when I got into grad school and I moved to Texas and it was just, I don't know if it was the specific 
department I was in, like the nutrition and dietetic school or like, there's just something, there was something very different about my university experience in the UK and then going to the US and um, being around a lot of students who were like very driven, very type A, very um, um, controlling around food. And then I was also on top of that receiving all of these nutrition messages. And it was, it, I guess it was just the perfect storm. And I was also away from my family and my friends. And um, then I, my, my eating became really disordered for a while. And, and that lasted even when I was doing my postdoc. And, um, I, I'm sorry, like really fast forwarding here. So, you know, feel free to stop me. No, you're great. You're doing great. Um, but then I guess I was, I was kind of maybe halfway through my postdoc or so, and I came across health at every size and I came across, um, this ebook called Tales from the Fatosphere. I think that's why I always get the name of this book wrong, but it is basically um, like a, a relatively early uh, fat acceptance book written by two, I think they were fashion bloggers, like fashion bloggers. Yeah. And it, it was my like first foray into health at every size and, um, and intuitive eating. And then I, from there, I started like, like reading more of the science behind that. And, um, and then sort of fast forward again to when I came back to the UK and I set up my clinical practice, I just to give some context, the UK was kind of like at the height of clean eating and that whole weird thing that happened. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's, still happening in the U S from what I see on Instagram, but that's another story. Um, we're, we're kind of largely getting over it over here, but, um, it was really at the height of all these clean eating books. And I, I saw a lot of people, they were coming to me and they were eating, you know, to, they were, they were eating according to these, cleaning plans and they were, you know, to all intents and purposes, they had, um, you know, a healthy in quotes diet, but they were really, really struggling with their relationship with food. And they had a lot of food anxieties and food rules and restrictions and they had no energy and they weren't getting the glow that they were promised. And just basically these, these clean eating diets were not delivering. They had GI issues. Surprise, surprise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I, I'm just thinking of, I know you wrote a, a post about recently about how sometimes we don't need more fiber in our diets. And that was definitely <laughs> the case for a lot of these people. I know, right? Just side note, like there is such a thing as too much fiber. Just just oh. throwing that out there, everybody. And if you have GI issues, look at that. <laughs> Cause... Totally. And that's even true for me. Like, I'm just going to hold my hand up and say, like, I, I have experienced that. <laughs> me too. I mean, I think everyone has. But it's funny. Then, then it's like, oh, no, I need to cut something out of my diet because I'm having these GI issues. And then they get worse and worse. Anyway, it's a whole thing. <laughs> totally is. And... Um, and people don't talk about it enough. So I really appreciated when you flagged that. I thought that was brilliant. Okay. So, um, so yeah, that basically that's how, um, so I, I guess when I initially started my practice, I did a lot more of the like myth busting thing, talking about the refined sugar free myth, talking about like the coconut oil thing and, and doing a lot of that stuff. But then I was like, yeah, this is good. This is helpful for my clients, but it's not the whole story. Right. Sometimes when we're in a really disordered place with food, the last thing we need is more nutrition information. Mm, what so we true. actually need is to take a step back from that nutrition information. And um, that's when I kind of recalled all, all the things I knew about intuitive eating or what I sort of started looking into before. And I, um, I really started immersing myself in that world and listening to podcasts and reading books and reading the papers importantly and reading the studies behind them. Um, and, and 
you know, did a lot of, of self-taught stuff around intuitive eating, did uh, a lot of CPD, and then went on to do the intuitive eating, the, my intuitive eating counselor certification. And yeah, that's, and now I'm writing a book about all of that. Yay! <laughs> or written, I've written a book. I've You've, written a book about It's all done. Of that. It's done. But you still have some steps to go to get there, right? Just more editing and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah, exactly. We've, we've been through the, the copy edit and I think they did the proofread while I was on honeymoon and um, I think they're going to be sending me some more proofs next week to Yay. look over and, and yeah, hopefully that is the end of the editing process because it's been going on for eight months. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> And meanwhile, you got married in in the middle of that. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been a bit of a year. <laughs> I bet. Okay, so so you got into this work, kind of realizing, wait a minute, sometimes people don't need to talk more about nutrition. Maybe there's you know some other things we can explore to then you know be more of that kind of looking at causes and conditions that lead us to experiencing suffering or pain in our lives rather than just like trying to heal the suffering and pain in and of itself. Does that, does that sort of resonate with what you just said? Yeah. And I sometimes conceptualize the, the disordered eating as a distraction or, or a coping mechanism, if that makes sense, like a, a misplaced or, or, or not the most healthy coping mechanism that we yeah. could use. Yeah, that makes, yeah, that makes total sense. And, and really is, definitely in line with what I see as well. So when you, I'm curious because I know you're so good at the science side of things, like I was <laughs> saying earlier, like, and I know I'm putting you on the spot here a little bit, but just on a high level, when you were new to discovering intuitive eating and you were diving into the studies, what were some things that you found and maybe what were some things that surprised you or challenged some paradigms? I'm just interested to hear more about what that process was like for you. Ah, okay. So I think one thing um, that actually uh, not it. I guess I'd already known this, but especially when I was researching the book, it stunned me, and it continues to do so. That we know that dieting has such an enormously high failure rate. We understand the mechanisms behind which it has such a spectacularly high failure rate, but we're still pushing it, <laughs> right? We're still like everything, all our research is geared towards trying to shrink bodies, even though we know that biologically that doesn't make any sense. I can't remember exactly um, what you said earlier, but it, it made me think of this actually, because we're not actually trying to find new solutions or different ways to approach the issue. We're just trying the same thing over and over and over and over and over again and trying to make it work, even though we know it's not going to work. Oh, that's such a good point. I love that. Thanks. Yeah. I came up with it myself. Oh, yeah. well, there you go. That's why you wrote a book about it. When I think of you, I think of, of a really skillful um, science and scientific communicator. And I... We wanted to talk about a little bit of the nuance of this very, uh, uh, very frequently cited article or, or stat about dieting. Uh, so do you want to just take it from there? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you. I feel like I need you as my little um, cheerleader in my pocket. I'm <laughs> a professional really cheerleader. I told my mom that the other day. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. Yeah, you should like pay get people to pay you for that that was amazing um so yeah this stat gets bandied about all over the place and it's a kind of a it, it really irks me whenever I hear it because I think it's a lot more nuanced than people let on and and I know you're a big fan of nuance page but it's like um, my favorite word yeah, I know, right? Hashtag nuance matters. And um, <sighs> it's, it, I, I want to make it very clear. So I'm going to just, I know we've been talking about this the, through the, throughout the podcast, so probably people already know this, but I am staunchly non-diet. Some people would even say militant. I, so I am very much coming at it 
I'm coming at this critique from that perspective. Um, and I don't want anyone to get the impression that I am, um, undermining the non-diet approach or the non-diet message. Cause that that's definitely not my intention. And I know you said recently in a podcast page that, um, when you, love something and care for something, it's important to look at it critically. And I yeah. agree that in order to push a paradigm forward and in order to not fall into the same, um, uh, not to be, um, complacent with, with our science and, and not to make the same mistakes that the traditional weight centric paradigm has made that we need to be critical of it. So, okay, that's that's my spiel. I'll get okay. to the point. Now. No, no, that's good. It's good to have that background. <laughs> so the stat that gets thrown around all the time is that 95% of diets fail. And I even hear people say that 95% plus of diets fail. And I, I'll agree that it's probably really high up there but I think just blanketly stating that 95% of diets fail, well, first of all, it's not supported by the evidence. And well, yeah, that's the main thing. It's not supported by the evidence. <laughs> so let me explain that a little bit. First of all, let me explain what the evidence, uh, or sorry, where that statistic came from, and then a little bit about what the evidence actually does say. So that, that statistic that 95% of um, diets fail, and I found this in, so this, this, this statistic is actually um, in a paper by Tracy Mann, but I don't, either she doesn't reference it or she doesn't give the right reference or something. So it's just kind of in there. And then I found another paper that actually discusses the root of this statistic, which is a paper from 1993 from Kelly Brunel, who is a researcher at Yale University, who points to the fact that this statistic came from a study um, by Stunkard and McLaren Hume in 1959, which was actually based on a very small study of uh, college students. And I, can't, I, I haven't actually read the study because you can't access it. At least I wasn't able to access it. But um, so that's where that's where the st statistic actually comes from. So it's a really old study. It was a really small study. It was a really um, uh, narrow population, right? Or it was a very specific population. So we know that we can't extrapolate that to the to the whole entire population of like the UK or the US or Brazil or Mexico or wherever. And um, so like immediately there should be all kinds of alarm bells going off if you're if you're a scientist or a clinician saying like that's not it's not up to date. It's old. It's, um, you know, problematic for a hundred reasons. And so I think that stat is garbage, basically, right? So we need to throw that out. We can't use that anymore because it's not accurate. What we can say, and this is again where the nuance comes in, is there are a couple of more up-to-date studies and none of them are particularly, um, I mean, they all look pretty bleak for diets. Let's just put it out there. But there is a study from 2001 which is a meta-analysis. So for anyone who's not familiar, a meta-analysis is where you take a whole bunch of small individual studies, pull them all together, and then see what the, the like collectively that all the pieces together say. And this is a really powerful kind of study. It gives us a lot more information than just the, the all the little EB individual studies. And that particular paper, this uh, meta-analysis from 2001, which I know that still sounds quite old, but it's actually one of the best, most recent studies that we have, concluded that the people in, in the studies who, um, who lost weight regained 79% of that weight after five years. So, okay, straight out the gate, not, not great. 
But then we also have to layer on the fact that within that meta-analysis, you have a couple of different types of research bias. So you have something called publication bias, which is where, spoiler, we only publish studies that show an effect. So all of those studies that maybe didn't show an effect or weren't worth publishing or didn't you know, get published because they didn't meet whatever criteria aren't included in this study. And then secondly, the, um, there's also what's called an observation bias. So in real life, if you go to Weight Watchers or Slimming World, or I don't know if you have that in the US, Rosemary Connolly or whatever, we like, don't. They're, all the, <laughs> they're all the same thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so if you go, um, you might be like, you might check in at a meeting once a week, you might have a, an app, you might have a buddy who you're doing your diet with, but you don't have a freaking team of researchers running around measuring you, weighing you, telling you what to eat, um, scientists recording all kinds of measurements of your body and potentially even bodily fluids. Um, and, and so there's, there's just by virtue of the fact that you're being observed by scientists that will change the outcome. And, and usually that it will mean that you will lose more weight because you're very compliant. You're very motivated. Otherwise you wouldn't have signed up for the study in the first place. And so when we look at, when we look at that meta-analysis and the fact that 79% of people regain that weight after five years, there, there are all these other, um, bits to it, like all these other biases and confounding factors that we don't talk about. So, okay. Does that, does that all make sense so far? Cause I've got one other little bit. That yeah, I no, you're doing, that. you're doing great. Okay. So what, what we're saying just to recap is that 79% of people regained the weight that they lost. Now, what all that stu- all that study did was take into account people who successfully in quotes lost weight now what we what we still don't know is did everyone that attempted to lose weight actually lose weight in the first place right that's a big question yeah so what they did was they wanted to understand how um weight loss worked or dieting worked in the real world And so there was another meta-analysis, but this time they pulled together studies of um, kind of what they consider to be real world scenarios where people were going to Weight Watchers and doing, you know, diet replacements and things. So these are structured weight loss programs, uh, but they maybe had a little less support than in that first meta-analysis that I discussed. And this this was a meta-analysis that just came out at last year, which is really interesting, specifically because on the National Health Service in the UK, Weight Watchers is like something you can get vouchers for to go to for free. But here's the thing, it's not evidence-based. So in this meta-analysis, they found that almost 60% of the individuals who started these weight loss programs lost less than 5% of their initial body weight. And so just to give that a little bit of context, losing 5% of your body weight is considered to be successful dieting, but only 40% of the people in the study were actually able to quote successfully diet in the first place. So if you, if you kind of extrapolate or kind of like think about those two studies together, only 40% of people were able to lose the clinically significant weight loss in the first place. And then people poop back on 80% of that weight. Okay. That is such a, that is such a more nuanced picture than the 95% of diets fail. Right. And so that's, yeah, I get a little agitated when people just say 95 and I understand that you can't say that every single time you can't go through what I just said yeah (laughs) it's true but but, so usually I just I just leave it at we know that diets have a really high failure rate and then I'll explain some of like the biological mechanisms behind that and the impetus for weight regain and metabolic adaptions and you know 
cravings changing and, and those kinds of things. Um, and then, you know, if, if people want to have a more nuanced conversation, and I think where this is in, incredibly important is when you're having these conversations with researchers, with doctors, with clinicians, because I think, frankly, if we just go around spouting that 95% statistic to other, you know, people who are savvy and educated and have access to the literature, we look like idiots, right? Like we look, we come off looking badly as non-diet practitioners if we don't understand the nuance of these studies. Mm, that is such a good point. Thank you for taking so, the time to explain all of that. <laughs> yeah, no problem. What do you think is going through people's minds, like like physicians' minds who are saying some atrocious things to my clients. And granted, there are some amazing physicians who, who give great advice too. But just the stories I hear, I'm like, oh, what what would kind of cause someone to, to say that or like think that way? I don't know. Do you have an insight into that? I'm not sure that I have a, a great answer, but I, I think what you were talking about there, which is, is weight stigma on the behalf of clinicians, but also researchers are, you know, it's, it's really interesting as, as researchers, we are supposed to be completely independent. We're not supposed to have any biases. We're to all intents and purposes. We're supposed to be a robot scientist, right? We're not supposed to have, um, any preconceived notion of the outcome of our studies, but that, but academia is so heavily weight biased that that infiltrates every single aspect of um, research, of um, our clinical guidelines, of our both you know dietetic practice, nutrition practice, um, medicine. And um, I think I've been encouraged recently, especially, well, certainly in the UK, there seems to be a much, much bigger conversation about weight stigma. And I actually, the, the weight stigma conference was in, in the UK uh, earlier this year. And it was great to see a lot more people talking about it, but it's, I also had this conversation with, with someone at that conference, which was essentially like, we have all the research on weight stigma that we need. We don't need any more research. We need action and we need legislation and we need um, training, like anti-weight bias training for uh, clinicians and and especially for researchers. Um, but that's that's what it kind of boils down to for me is is weight stigma and unchecked bias. And and there was a great paper that for anyone who is um, in academia or research or just for their own interest, there was a great paper in the British Medical Journal. I think it was either at the end of last year or the beginning of this year, which actually lists all the the um, assumptions made by a weight focus paradigm. And and it was great to see this in a mainstream medical journal. And there's a fantastic podcast about it uh, or with with one of the author, authors of the study as well. Um, so even if you can, you know, don't aren't in, <laughs> that way inclined to read a scientific paper, listening to the podcast is really great because it succinctly summarizes all of these assumptions that we make. In, Where's that podcast? In, it's on the website of the British Medical Journal. Oh, OK, OK. So I can I'll send you the link for the, the show notes, but it's really interesting. And it just it kind of um, I don't know, it gave me a little bit of hope that we are actually beginning to change this conversation. So really quick, I'm always sensitive that it might be someone's first time uh, being exposed yeah. to these ideas. So let's just take a minute and talk about what is weight stigma? Uh, what is the research you're talking about? And then kind of how does it affect us? OK, so. Uh, we actually have to probably break it down even more than that. So there, there are two things that we need to talk about. So there's weight stigma and, and weight bias. So maybe let's talk about weight bias. So first of all, weight bias is the um, assumptions made about people in larger bodies, just purely based on physically how they present to the world, right? Just because they are fat, they must do X, Y, and Z. So the way that that plays out in, let's say, a clinical setting is, um, and this has been 
disproved to me over and over and over again by my, my clients. So let's just say for instance, a fat client walks into my office and I automatically assume that they are lying to me about what, how much they eat, um, and under reporting, or they are, um, not compliant with their diet or they're not exercising enough. That would be my bias based not on fact or evidence, but just based purely on their body. And, um, the result, I guess, um, the result of weight bias is some, is weight stigma, which is where, um, people of a higher body weight, and I haven't, I haven't been <laughs> memorizing the exact definitions of these, so I, w- I might need to double check this, but, That's okay. um, and I've, I've got a, I can, I can send a great, um, I'm going to send you the link to the world health organization report on this, which actually has the specific, like the actual technical definitions. But to me, weight stigma is, is a consequence of weight bias and it doesn't, weight bias isn't just held by clinicians, but it can be held by just any old person. And it's, um, sort of the consequence of, of that bias, which is, um, prejudice and bigotry and hatred and judgments and, um, assumptions made about people in larger bodies. Um, so that could, again, just to, give an example to illustrate this, that could be, um, so, uh, perhaps, a, a fat person walking down the street, doing their own thing, minding their own business. And somebody yells, uh, um, a fat phobic slur at them. So, so yells something mean at them because of their, their weight. Um, or, um, it could actually manifest not just as, as verbal abuse, but physical abuse, um, attacks. Um, it also can manifest as, um, less job opportunities, less or poor educational attainment in, um, yeah, totally in schools. Like there are so many very tangible consequences of this. Disordered eating is another one. All kinds of poor psychological and physiological health consequences. And so it's a really, it's a huge public health concern because our public health messages for the, by and large, or at least the nutrition ones are inherently fat or are fat phobic and stigmatize people based on the size of their bodies. Which then, <clears throat> which then reinforces all of, of the bias that you just outlined mm-hmm. and talked about. But then also like, and I don't want to just make this about thin people, but I do want to connect this conversation to thin people listening so that we understand like, this isn't a conversation only about fat people. This is about how all of us, regardless of body size, feel about the inevitable shifts our bodies are going to make throughout our lifetimes Mm -hmm. and and if we're fat phobic like in our in our the way that we just move through the world if we're so scared of that that's going to affect our relationship with food Mm -hmm. um regardless of body size and again someone in a larger body is for sure experiencing the harmful effects of weight stigma um, but also someone in a smaller body is experiencing the harmful effects of the fear of, of that that gets instilled in pretty much all of us. Well, and I would say it even extends beyond the, the psychological implications to, to very real, tangible, physical um, implications. So, for instance, if you have a doctor, a physician who is who has who holds their own internalized weight bias or an an internalized weight stigma. If you are, um, a thin person and you walk into their office, they're, they're going to make a lot of assumptions about you based on your size. And they're, they might not screen you from, for type two diabetes or high cholesterol, or, um, I, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that, um, a lot of, of, health conditions might kind of fly under the radar because a person is thin. So, um, 
they they may end up not not getting screened for things that they're at risk for because the assumption is that oh because you're thin you're not at risk for them even though they might have a family history or they might smoke or they might um you know drink more alcohol than is healthy for them and um they might be over exercising and you know be yeah or have yeah extreme disordered behaviors in order to maintain that that smaller weight and we know that people who restrict and are very underweight actually have higher cholesterol which puts them at risk for cardiovascular disease so um the point is i think what we're trying to say here is that weight bias and weight stigma affect people all across the weight spectrum so it's everybody's problem that's such a great point that it affects everybody and it's everybody's problem therefore all of us really should aim to be part of the solution. Um, And it seems to me like that's a big reason why you wanted to write your book. Is that right? Yeah, I think for me, what it comes down to is leveraging my professional privilege to help raise awareness um, of weight stigma and fat phobia, you know, hopefully amongst other professionals. But certainly amongst the sort of general consciousness as well. And to encourage thin allies to call out weight stigma and fat phobia. And that might look like, you know, maybe you just, your mom makes a weird comment about, you know, or makes an assumption about some, what someone's eating because of their, um, their body size and, you know, what that might, look like in terms of being an ally is saying, well, actually we we don't know what, what that person is eating. And and that assumption is fat phobic. And actually we know that weight stigma and fat phobia lead to negative physical and mental health outcomes. So is that really a helpful comment for that person? No, I don't think it is. And, you know, and starting that conversation with people around you, or maybe it's calling it out on social media or in advertising or wherever you see it. Um, and, and just kind of collectively raising our consciousness about these issues. Okay. I want to give another example. That was such a good one that you gave. Um, just over the weekend, I was hanging out with a family member and, uh, we have, we have some cancer in our family. Um, and it's been really, really tough to deal with, of course. And I'm sorry. yeah, this, this person was saying, um, well, we, we know that, uh, smoking is a risk factor. We know that obesity is a risk factor and they just kind of listed, you know, things that they had heard. And I said, mm-hmm. well, let's question, let's question that one about weight from what I've heard and read and talked with my clients about, um, it is so scary to go to the doctor that it gets pushed off and pushed off and pushed off that then, you know, sometimes people don't go to the doctor until it is just, there's zero, you know, other choices or the cancer or whatever it is, is so progressed that, um, that that's just where they've ended up. And so either that or, um, the, the doc, the doctor doesn't believe or doesn't really test for or take seriously some of the concerns of the patient due to their body size. And so then Mm -hmm. some of the things can fly under the radar and, you know, maybe they would have tested for cancer in a thinner body versus the larger body. The the advice is always, well, just, just lose weight. And so when I, when I said this to this person, she was like, you know what, that's a really good point. I could see how it's problematic to necessarily say, you know, weight causes this condition because there's so many more questions about, you know, when did they seek care and and, uh, what was their care like and things along those lines. So I think, I hope I explained that okay, but that's another way to kind of gently say, well, have you thought about it this way? Because I was surprised to learn this or, you know, and and I think it's good to kind of meet people uh, where they are in terms of like recognizing they might not hear certain words easily, you know, like you might not be able to give, get your message across if you're, really confrontational about it, but just say, yeah, I I can see why you'd, you'd say that. That's something that said a lot, but here's something I've learned, you know? So. Yeah, absolutely. I think that piece of, of meeting people where they're at is so important because it might, I mean, and (laughs) this is a frustration that I have, um, you know, talking about these issues publicly and on social media is that 
everyone's at a different point in their journey and they might need to hear that three or four times and they might ask questions, which to you feel really obtuse and annoying. <laughs> and like you've gone over them 300 times already. Yeah, but... scroll back <laughs> through the other posts. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to that podcast I did two years ago. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And, and so I, I also have to check myself when I'm having those conversations and just remind myself that, okay, they may not have heard this before, or they may not have heard this in this exact way. And, and maybe, you know, this will help them connect. And, um, I've, I've definitely, you know, when I can, um, muster up the patience to have these conversations, it, it, it's, it's amazing that people, will get there eventually. It's just, it takes a little bit of time. So yeah. that's for anyone who is, you know, struggling to, um, I don't know. I feel like when, when you get into this work, nobody tells you how difficult it is sometimes so and that true. your patience will be tested. So I like to throw that out there for any students or anyone who's moving to a, a non diet approach that just you'll get there. <laughs> yeah. And it is, I mean, it's a lot of work. It's a big mental shift. It's a lot of challenging yourself and recognizing where you've been wrong and that's painful stuff, you know? Yeah. So, um, I really, I feel for, for anyone going through it, especially if it hits home on a personal level, um, body size, and then all, obviously this stuff always collides with, with other intersections of identity, mm -hmm. with sexuality and race and um, class, right? Socioeconomic yeah. status, all of that stuff intersects with our relationships with food and our bodies. Sorry, yeah. that's a that's a truck getting the trash. I think outside oh, of my Oh, I office. thought you had. <laughs> it I sounded, thought you had like a thunderstorm. <laughs> yeah, it did sound it did sound like like thunder. Um, so I want to I want to ask about when when I went on your podcast, we talked a lot about um, this this thing floating around about kind of questioning how how we communicate the non-diet message and we we talked a lot about that and i think i think we had a great conversation anybody who's interested oh, it's such a great episode yeah yeah <laughs> yeah what do you have numbers for yours i forget do you know i do but um, okay maybe send me, me that one second. yeah yeah i'll definitely send you the link okay so i wanted to ask you i wanted to talk more about this when i was on yours uh i'm curious i just feel like we're in this interesting time where we're trying to communicate really sensitive, um, tricky messages about food and bodies uh, on a very public place. And obviously you have a really big following. You have uh, a lot of people following along your work. And like you said, a lot of new people popping in and maybe being kind of not caught, not caught up with where you are and what you're talking about. And so you're having uh -huh. to do a lot of this kind of education piece. I'm just curious what, like, on a really kind of broad level, what's been your experience trying to communicate such sensitive topics online? How have you navigated that? Um, and maybe we can just talk a little bit about that because I think that's an interesting topic for, you know, the lay person listening, but also maybe for the professional audience as well. Like, how do we communicate this message in an effective way when it's so tricky and nuanced? Ah, uh, honestly, I'm still learning. I'm still trying to figure that out. And I, I definitely don't have all the answers. Um, it's a tough question, Paige. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a totally, it's a totally fair question and it's totally valid. And I have to hold my hands up and say like, I don't always think I do the best job. And I'm, um, I'm always learning, especially about the social justice piece, which I care so deeply about, but I'm afraid of getting things wrong. And that sometimes holds me back from saying the things that I would like to say. So um, before we go deeper into that, just take a minute and talk about like, what do you mean by the social justice piece? Just in case, again, someone's like, what is it? What? Social justice and food? What do they mean? So, I, okay, I guess just circling back to the conversation that we were having before, um, I think that's a, a great example of how this work around eating disorder prevention and um, uh, kind of trying to help liberate people from the sort of clutches of diet culture butts up against social justice issues is that um, 
So weight stigma and fat phobia, like any other types of phobia, whether it's uh, homophobia or racism, um, I guess, sorry, to back up a second, what, what I'm trying to say here is that weight stigma is still con- is a socially acceptable form of prejudice. So in the same way that um, historically racism and homophobia and transphobia have have been um, just the norm, right, for a really long time. And I'm by absolutely no means saying that we don't have problems with homophobia and racism and transphobia and, and these other things, because we absolutely do. But they're much more in the collective consciousness and, and people are talking about it and pushing back on it. And there have been a lot of strides made for um, the rights of those people. However, we're still stuck in the dark ages when we're talking about fat people and fat bodies. And so in, in that sense, um, for a long time, and, and I acknowledge that things are definitely shifting and changing now, especially with, you know, academia embracing conversations around weight stigma, we're, we're starting to acknowledge that weight stigma and fat phobia are, um, are forms of bigotry, of prejudice, of oppression, of marginalization of bodies. And, um, so I, so that's where, um, this work butts up against social justice issues. And, um, I think where it gets even more complicated is when fat bodies also hold other intersecting identities. And so you're talking about not just fat phobia, but then maybe also um, fat phobia and racism and homophobia. And those are not my experiences. What I'm trying to say is that um, I'm still learning and still um, trying to understand how I can be a good ally and how I can um, help raise up the people who have traditionally been um, marginalized or othered by society that values thin, white, young, abled bodies. Um, and, and talking about some of the other social justice issues around that. And, and I don't want to say too much on that because A, I don't feel like I know enough. And B, the issues I think that you're facing in the U.S. are different from the issues that we're facing in the UK. So, and I don't know as much yeah, about the U S yeah. political landscape as I did when I was living there. So I don't want to say too much about that, but, um, did that answer your question? Yeah, that, no, that was I, really rambly. <laughs> no, it was great. Like, honestly, the answer of like, I don't know, I'm figuring it out, I think is really kind of where we all are. I mean, this is such a, a new frontier of communication and, um, Kind of oh, new... yeah, you were talking about social media. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's great. I, I guess I, <clears throat> I, I, want, I wanted to also clarify that idea of why this conversation about eating disorder prevention and about bodies and about food, why we would talk about that being a social justice issue because, you know, health at every size is a social justice movement. And so if you look at uh, what is actually what the you know principles and philosophy behind it is is there's there's definitely a social a very important social justice aspect to this idea of body liberation and so when we're you know it seems like yeah like we're both nutrition people and so we're going to be talking about like food and eating and nutrition and well obviously I think that matters it's also really important to recognize we can't really talk about food without talking about bodies. We can't really talk about bodies without talking about how our bodies are inherently political and how they intersect mm-hmm. with with so many other identities and so many other aspects of marginalization and oppression. And um, I'm learning too, Laura, like this mm-hmm. is it. And we need to acknowledge like we are two um, women who are young and able-bodied and white and educated, right? So like we we are what society would look at and say, those are, they're healthy and they're happy and blah, 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 right? Like they're great. And, but you know, if we happen to have one of those other identities of, of 
different, a different race or a different body size or a different whatever it might be, uh, sexuality, things along those lines, we would automatically, you know, be in a different privileged space or a different, you know, level of privilege, a different position to be able to even have these conversations on a podcast, right? And like like we talked about on your podcast, just this question mm-hmm. of like, how do we communicate these messages? And, and how do we as people who have a background in nutrition, how do we talk about the food side of this equation? Um, what are what are your thoughts about the trickiness of, of having conversations about food when maybe in some ways it's about the food and maybe in a lot of ways it's not at all about the food? How do you handle that? So, yeah, this is something I think about a lot. It keeps me up at night. <laughs> um, so, okay, a, a couple of different things that I think are maybe important to say here. So first of all, I am making a very concerted effort to use my podcast and to use my platform to have conversations with other people who hold marginalized identities to have these difficult conversations with, to, to do that thing that I mentioned before, where you, you give them a platform and you listen to what they have to say and you learn from them on my social media. I don't feel like I can, I mean, I can share other people's stuff, work, and I do, but I don't think I can, as a, you know, all of the things that you said, as a very privileged person, (laughs) I, I don't think I can talk about those issues as though they are my own experiences and I wouldn't want to talk for other people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I try and give other people the platform to talk so we can hear from them directly. My Instagram is more about the nuts and bolts of intuitive eating. That said, I do talk a lot about weight stigma there because I feel like that is, that's is what I know. That's what I've done a lot of research into That's what I have a lot of experience working with clients in. So that's really, if we're talking about, um, you know, if I, if I say, okay, this, this is the social justice issue that I feel really strongly and really passionately about. So I, I'm going to talk about this one thing vocally. Um, I get really ragey about it sometimes when I see, uh, (laughs) there was a, there was a spell earlier this year where, um, our, a couple of different public health organizations in the UK were doing some really dumb stuff and it sent me into a rage spiral. (laughs) And so, and I was talking about how, you know, a lot of these campaigns, a lot of campaigns that they were coming out with were fat phobic and, um, not only that, but like that relationship with disordered eating and eating disorders and how they were effectively promoting eating disorder behaviors as well. So that's Ah. (laughs) so problematic. Yeah. So that's that's how I try and manage things um, in terms of m- my platforms. The other thing, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this, although it's kind of too late. So if you don't like it, Paige, <laughs> we can't do anything about it because <laughs> I've written the book. But basically, the way that I have um, tried to conceptualize things in the book is this. I've said okay, you need to get your stuff together around food. You need to- You need to get your get... shit together around food. That's, yeah, isn't that okay. the, so, that's the oh, tag. I'm gonna say it. <laughs> <laughs> Just for everyone listening, okay. Laura is like, queen of swearing and on the podcast i try to just like keep it keep it pg for the listeners but um <laughs> anyway I'm, i was I like, like for the record to show that i have not sworn once not I'm once i'm proud of you <laughs> i okay i want people to gather stuff together around food because it's In the grand scheme of things, like, and I understand, like, for people who are in disordered eating patterns or eating disorders, that is their whole world. I don't want it to be your whole world because there's a a whole world of other stuff that needs and deserves our attention. But if we are consumed by trying to shrink our bodies and by buying into the lies of diet culture, we are distracted, we are oppressed, and we are unable to to fight the fights that need to be fought and by that I mean these social justice issues 
that dieting and diet culture is, is keeping us distracted from. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I totally agree. I, that's kind of how I see um, nutrition being more meaningful than just talking about carbohydrate, fat, and protein. I think I see my role as helping people learn to honor their bodies, trust their bodies, develop a sense of um, maybe even appreciation for their bodies, spend less time focusing on food and nutrition and body yeah. image yeah. so that then they have that time and energy to go do the things that they're really good at, right? Because I'm good at this stuff. They're good at, you know, computer stuff or good at social justice um, activism or whatever yeah. it might be. Like, I think we all, the world would be a better place if we all put our energies toward what we're really good at rather than spending so much time and energy on this food stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, think about all the, the time and the money and the effort that you spend chasing the kind of quote ideal body. Imagine if we took all of those and all of that energy and all of those reserve resources and put it towards um, a social enterprise or a volunteering project or helping in your community or addressing you know, or getting involved in politics so you can change things structurally. You know, like there's there's so much that we can do um, to help other people. It's not just, you know, getting on social media and writing a blog post or getting on social media and, um, I don't know, tweeting an article or something like that. Like we need to be more actively engaged, I think, in our communities, in our political processes, you know, whichever side I'm not like trying yeah, to say no. <laughs> <laughs> what to do and whatever side you fall on. But like, you know, um, I guess to answer your question, that's how I address that social justice pieces. And it's exactly what you're saying. I'm, I'm doing the things that I'm good at, which is helping people build a healthier relationship with food so that they are they're free from um, body hate and free from uh, disordered eating patterns and thinking about food all of the time so that we can then address these bigger socio-political issues. Love it. So Laura, take a minute and talk about your book, what it is, what the premise is, kind of um, what need you, you see it solving or working to start a conversation about in the community at large. Yeah, so uh, kind of, you know, what I spoke about at the beginning in terms of um, my practice is where is is based on helping people build a, a healthier, happier relationship with food so they can lead more fulfilling lives and not be uh, trapped in, in body hate. And like I said before, I use uh, the, the intuitive eating model and, and a weight inclusive lens and use non-diet nutrition. And so by that, all I mean is, <laughs> um, I don't try and force people on diets in order to cure everything, <laughs> which is the kind of standard model. Um, and, and so, yeah, basically the book is, is using the principles of intuitive eating to help you get your stuff together around food. And, um, it, so it's, different from the book intuitive eating in the sense that, you know, the principles are, they're largely the same, but they're slightly reshuffled around and in a way that makes more sense, um, to me and my practice in terms of how you present them and, and work through them. But it's also adding some of this, some of the things that we've been talking about in terms of like weight stigma and weight bias. I also address some of the, um, the reasons why we struggle with body image in the first place. So things like self objectification and the thin ideal internalization yeah, yeah. And, and a big chapter, like right at the very beginning is around self-compassion. So it's it's this idea of, of befriending yourself and, and being able to let yourself off the hook when things don't, you know, go according to plan or going the way that you want them exactly. And um, I think that's just... Uh, um, it applies to not just the intuitive eating process, but to life oh, <laughs> in general. Oh, definitely, yeah. And, and so I like to think that, okay, you're getting your stuff together around food, like that's what the focus of the book is. But there are all these skills, I think, that can transfer 
to other areas of your life. So getting out of um, black and white rigid thinking, um, get sort of letting go of perfectionism, mindfulness and self-compassion. So there are, you know, one, one thing I often hear from people is, especially people who have disordered eating or eating disorders, right? The problem is never the food, right? The problem isn't, it's not food. That's just a symptom. And so a question I always get asked is, well, why are you still talking about food? And my answer is that sometimes we need to sort the food stuff out so that we have the space and the capacity to deal with what the actual problem is. Mm, yes. Some, for some people, it's the other way around. But I know for so many people that until they kind of take the weight off of, of um food and body image and, and eating issues that they can't actually get to the deeper problem. Oh. That, that's what I have to say about that. Well, uh, take a minute, Laura, and talk about how people can follow you if they don't already and how they can keep in touch with your work and hear about the book coming out. Sure. Yeah. So my podcast is called Don't Salt My Game and Paige has been on it and lots of other great people and we're talking all about intuitive eating and body acceptance and some other health issues that we're kind of looking at through a, a non-diet lens as well. It's and a great then, podcast. Highly recommend. Oh, thanks Paige. Yeah. Uh, and uh, oh, my Instagram and Twitter are at Laura Thomas PhD, but I'm mostly on Instagram because Twitter scares me. And um, <laughs> me <too>. yeah, my <laughs> I know, right. And my uh, podcast, sorry, my website is just laurathomasphd.co.uk. Oh, and I have a book which will be out <laughs> in. <laughs> this is the first time I've said it. Yay! Um, it will be out in January 2019. And if you keep an eye on my socials, I'll let you know where you'll be able to get it depending on the region that you're in as well. So thank you so much for having me, Paige. I love having conversations with you because you love getting into the nuance and the nitty gritty and having those conversations that aren't always easy, but are important. Thank you so much for saying that. And I feel the same about you. And thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. This was a blast. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Paige. Well, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this conversation. If you haven't already, please go ahead and leave a review on iTunes. Thanks again so much for listening, and we'll see you soon for another episode.